My name is Norman Worsba. I teach at Duke University and I am pleased to bring this talk to you. Uh, it's called Doing Theology in an Anthropocene World. For some time now, people have been living in an Anthropocene world. This is a world where immense natural powers notwithstanding, human beings have become a world-defining power. From soil to atmosphere, there is hardly a geomorphological, biological, genetic, or meteorological system that does not witness to humanity's often criminal footprint. The twin pursuits of progress and prosperity have clearly brought multiple benefits to some people, but they have also wreaked havoc with most all the world's places and many of its creatures. When the founders of modern economies envisioned humans as the masters and possessors of Earth, did they also imagine systematic soil erosion and degradation, freshwater depletion and pollution, massive species extinction, the exploitation, enslavement, and extermination of indigenous and agricultural communities, the commodification of nearly everything, and the eclipse of humans by machines and algorithms, the list of woes is enormous. The assault on creatures and their places is systematic and thorough. So my question is, where were theologians in these developments? We know that many supported and walked alongside the destroyers of the earth. John's apocalypse in Revelation at 11 has a stark warning about this. Others, however, seemed oblivious or unconcerned perhaps because they believed that the work of theology was to be focused elsewhere, perhaps saving souls, building ecclesiastical kingdoms, providing personal therapy, or fighting with denominational rivals. Which brings me to the question for this presentation, where might theologians now be? What sort of theological work do we need for our Anthropocene world? I'll admit this is a big agenda, and so to give my remarks some parameters, I will focus on the role theologians might play if they took place-making seriously. By place-making, I mean to put the focus on what people can do to work with God in the nurturing and healing of places and the flourishing of its human and non-human inhabitants. Now, with the exception of a few theologians, placemaking as a focus of theological reflection has been largely absent. How can this be, given that many syllabi and texts that aim to teach theology have the doctrine of creation as one of its core elements? Is it that our Christian creation imaginations are fundamentally confused, perhaps even diseased, as Willie Jennings has argued? More broadly, have we been mistaken about what a place is and why places matter? If we are to talk about place making, I think we first need to slow down and clarify what we mean when we talk about creation and place. It is fairly common to think of a place as a location. An ancient philosophical tradition, going back to Aristotle, undergirds this way of speaking by describing a place as a container that holds and surrounds whatever it is that is contained. Think here of a pebble in a jar. The jar contains the pebble, gives it a place to reside, so that upon looking for the pebble, we know where to look. The jar is the location of the pebble. This characterization is eminently sensible. I would argue, however, that it is also fundamentally wrong because it misunderstands the world we are in and the various creatures that populate it. How so? Consider just two of the assumptions at work in this container location characterization. First, the container is more or less preformed and static. It is what it is regardless of what is placed within it, and so is unlikely to be deeply affected by what it holds. Put in a shoe or rope and the jar is still what it was before. The pebble, meanwhile, in the jar is also more or less preformed and static. The pebble is not much affected by the container it is in, which is why putting the pebble in a different container doesn't do much to change what the pebble itself is. 
I realize that you may not like to think of yourself as a pebble in a jar. Even so, the container logic is powerful and circulates through other metaphors that are commonly used to characterize a place. Think here of the language of the world as a stage, a production platform, or maybe a store or warehouse. People enact dramas on a stage or platform and they mine the natural resources that feed the ambitions these dramas are meant to serve. The shopping, shopping practices of daily life seem to communicate that the world's places are there to be viewed, altered, commodified, and purchased. Even the language of an environment as that which surrounds us reinforces the idea that people are essentially apart from or rise above their places and thus can engage them however they want or simply move on. Places are merely backdrop or staging for the important stuff people do. The theological correlate, I suggest, would be salvation of people can happen without giving a thought to the salvation of the ecological context through which they live. According to this way of thinking, places are separable from the people who inhabit and use them. If you don't like where you currently are, you can look for a new location. Though some people may have a special attachment to a particular place, in the main, the presumption of separability remains, which is why we have a number of ostensibly smart and well-funded engineers working on creating the technostructures that will make a home for rich people on other planets. Places, even Earth itself, are backdrop locations that give people a place to stand, to operate, and be located but they do not enter deeply into what we understand a human life to be about or how a human life is constituted. The result is that we have economists for whom land and water do not register as anything other than inputs in a manufacturing process and theologians for whom fields, energy, construction sites are pretty much irrelevant for their thinking about the life of faith or the nature and mission of the church. The central problem with this way of thinking is that it not only presumes a static, perhaps even dead world, a world that does not enter deeply into the constitution of a human life, it also presumes a picture of persons exercising life as a power that is internal to them and thus as intrinsically separable from the world in which they move. Again, this way of thinking is ancient. Consider Socrates describing a pre existing soul that temporarily enters a body, animates it from within, and then, hopefully, departs again upon death. Even if we don't self-describe as followers of Socrates, the fact remains that the dualistic logic he articulated is alive and well today when people assume some version of the immortality of the soul or the immortality of one's personality, information pattern, or software program. The power of life and the crux of one's identity are within the confines of our container skin. Though we may have relationships with places and with other creatures, they are mostly voluntary in nature and often characterized as ephemeral. A new relationship is always on the horizon. As I have already suggested, this characterization is a massive mistake. Why? because it misunderstands places and people. A place, while certainly being a geographical location, a specific where, is not reducible to being a physical spot on a map. More fundamentally, a place is a dynamic moving site where multiple paths of co-development and co-becoming are happening all the time. A place is not static, it is constantly changing according to various timescales because the paces and processes of germination, growth, photosynthesis, reproduction, decomposition, tectonic plate uplift, carbon capture, hydrological cycles, all processes that are absolutely essential to the flourishing of any life form whatsoever, these cycles, they're not the same, nor are places easily delimited. The borders that we establish to identify a particular place are basically more or less useful fictions 
because each so-called place depends ultimately on what is happening in every other place. Durham County, where Duke is, does not end at the county line sign, nor could it be what it is apart from the state of North Carolina, the continent of North America, the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, planet Earth, our solar system, the Milky Way, and on and on it goes. Similarly, persons are not static or self-contained. No matter how much you may like to think of yourself as a discrete individual being, you are in fact a zoo that is constantly on the move and necessarily and most intimately bound up in the lives of others. The marks of your entanglements with others are visible on your body if you're paying attention to things like belly buttons, nostrils, and mouths. Being born, eating, drinking, breathing, these are not optional activities. They constitute your life. And if you go inside your body, the picture becomes even more complex once you consider your gut biome. Here, literally billions of organisms are living with and through you so that you can fulfill the basic digestive and immunological functions that make up your life. Before you have made any decisions at all, your body, your life, besides being hosted by other bodies and maintained by a bewildering array of geo, bio, eco-chemical processes, is host to billions of other life forms, all of which are constantly moving, acting upon and through you. In summary, a place is not reducible to being a location, and a person is not a neatly circumscribable, separable entity that merely inhabits it for a time. You are, instead, a changeable, permeable site through which an unimaginably vast, diverse, temporally extended, and dynamic constellation of paths develop and subside. Paths that root you into soils and watersheds and stitch you into life with bees and chickens and ultimately every other creature. There is no you apart from a place because each place is a dynamic constellation of paths that intersects with and nurtures your becoming. In multiple respects, it would be more accurate if we spoke of places and persons more as verbs rather than as nouns. A lot, a lot more I know needs to be said, but we now need to move on to the term creation. For many of the Christians I meet, the doctrine of creation is primarily about God creating the world a long, long time ago. We may dispute how long ago, but the primary point is that we affirm God made it. As such, the teaching is believed to be about origins. It is of tremendous importance that we affirm creation as having its origin in God. But if that is where we leave it, we are again making a huge mistake. The mistake resides in thinking that creation is not also, also vitally important to our thinking about the goal or purpose of everything and not just the beginning and end of things, but also their current meaning and significance. I think it is helpful if we can shift our thinking about creation so that we understand it as establishing a moral and spiritual topography that invites people to orient their living in ways that witness to and extend God's ways of being with the world, ways that have been revealed to us in the witness of Israel, and in the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. In other words, insofar as we are inspired by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we will come to perceive and engage every place and every creature in ways that witness to the animating, feeding, healing, reconciling, befriending, and exercising ways of God. The teaching of creation isn't primarily about it all, how it all began, especially if we are fixated on the mechanics or causal processes of God's, create, God's creativity. It is instead about what places and creatures mean, what they are for, how they signify, and how they might best witness to the divine love that animates and nourishes them. Christians, I would argue, have often been mistaken about, about creation because they have been influenced by the dualist anthropologies and container location topologies I have been describing. 
consider for a moment how this is reflected in Christian thinking about heaven. The idea shared by many is that when people die, their separable soul will go to be with God forever in heaven. But where is heaven? Anywhere but here, because the places of our lives are filled with too much pain and suffering, too much violence and injustice. This way of characterizing heaven as another location we hope to get to is naive, because it assumes that upon getting somewhere else, life will suddenly be better. Should we not remember that people already banished themselves from Eden, the garden of paradise, and so would likely banish themselves again from some new heavenly location if there is not first a fundamental transformation of the ways of relating between creatures in their places? It isn't enough to think of heaven as another location. Insofar as heaven is the place of God's life, heaven is the place where the, co- where the paths of co-development and co-becoming are inspired and empowered by the love of God and nothing else. In other words, heaven isn't reducible to a location somewhere far away. Heaven is the transformation of life processes in every place so that creatures experience the power of God's love circulating through every encounter and every relationship. I think this is what John meant when he described the heavenly city descending to earth, transforming the places and processes of this life so that pain and suffering are no more. In other words, Let's think about a spirituality of transformation rather than a spirituality of escape. For Socratic or transhumanist dualists, this characterization of heaven is probably disappointing because the lure of escape to another location is so enticing. It is much easier to accept that I merely have to get to another place and all will be well. It is a lot harder to believe that the work of faith compels Christians to participate in God's transforming power, working to heal and nurture and reconcile and beautify every place here and now, all of which presupposes a radical transformation of persons, what the Apostle Paul in Romans 6 called the crucifixion of the old self and a resurrection into new life with Jesus Christ. A shorthand way to put this is to say that the aim of Christian life is not a massive escape project from location Earth, but is instead a transformation of all the paths and processes of life, all the ways of co-becoming that intersect our bodies and the flesh of the world, so that altogether they witness to the new creation inaugurated by the embodied movements of God in Jesus Christ. I realize This is a lot of preamble, but I think it is vitally important because it casts place-making in a fundamentally new light. For starters, how does place-making change if self-making and place-making are but sides of the same coin, and the soul's escape to another location called heaven is not really an option? How do we imagine and implement place-making if God is descending to earth to dwell with us, to make his home among mortals, as John's apocalypse says. What forms of imagination and attention do we need to perceive this world, which includes our homes, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our watersheds and farm fields, all as God's dwelling place? What kinds of affection and what particular practical skills do we need to witness in our places in the economies and built environments we create to the transforming power of God's love. As we now turn to the art of placemaking, the first point to make is that Christians do not start from scratch. The triune God has already given and continues to give us the inspiration and instruction we need to move. I grant that our creativity differs from God insofar as God creates ex nihilo, and God resurrects, even so, we have multiple creation accounts in Scripture, the incarnate ministries of Jesus, and the witness of the Holy Spirit at work in the world to guide us. 
So what do the forms and modes of God's own creativity say to us? John of Damascus once said that we can understand God's creative work as God making room for other creatures to be. As such, the action of divine creativity is fundamentally a, hosp a hospitable action in which God opens the places and paths of co-becoming that generate diverse, fertile, and fecund creaturely life. As scripture makes clear, the work of divine hospitality welcomes creatures, nurtures and sustains creatures, and then liberates creatures so that they can more fully live into life with others. That Jesus is the one through whom creatures come to be and in whom creatures hold together, as the Christ hymn in Colossians 1 puts it, means that all deistic notions of a God who jumpstarts creation and then leaves it to itself are fundamentally mistaken. The incarnation of God in Jesus Christ, remembering that is the, it is the fullness pleroma of God that dwelled bodily in him, means that God's embrace of creaturely embodied and placed life is comprehensive and complete. The witness of the Holy Spirit furthermore testifies to the fact that God does not ever leave creatures to themselves and alone, but comes alongside them as the inspiring, animating power that leads to communion and hopefully convivial life together. As theologians would later articulate their understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, it was clear to them that God remains present and active as the power that heals, beautifies, and perfects creature in life. Again, much more needs to be said. We now need to turn to what these theological claims mean for the practical disciplines of placemaking. What does placemaking look like if it is to witness to and participate in divine hospitable action? We can begin with the daily exercise of eating. Cooking isn't simply one of humanity's most primal arts. It is also the practical art that has decisively shaped the places of our world. Agriculture has done more to transform and damage planet Earth than any other human activity, especially if we take into account deforestation, the drainage of wetlands, the building of massive irrigation projects, the production of greenhouse gases, the abuse of animals, and the construction of global supply and distribution lines. Much of today's food, having been abstracted out of its histories of co-development, does not witness to any of this. The stores are always full. What is clear is that so much agriculture has amounted to the imposition of an idea or an ambition or a financial projection upon a place. Regions and creatures, including conscripted and enslaved people, have been reduced to units of production and consumption, and so have not been welcomed and nurtured to live into the fullness of their lives. A better, more hospitable agriculture, and thus also a better food system, would require that farmers, gardeners, and eaters first pay attention to where they are, study the multiple paths of co-becoming that are happening there, and develop the practical skills like water and soil conservation, cover cropping, riparian repair, crop rotations, animal husbandry, properly scaled work, processing and distribution. All these that will lead to an increase in fertility and fecundity. The tools of regenerative agriculture, agriculture are well practiced and readily known. What is needed are the creation of economies along with the education of consumers who advocate for the necessary political changes so that farmers can contribute to the healing and the beautification of our lands. What has been said about agriculture can also be said about built environments more generally. To what extent do design and engineering projects, whether applied to energy infrastructure or commercial and residential construction, reflect God's hospitable modalities? History shows that far too often an assessment of what a place recommends and what its, what its members 
genuinely need are eclipsed by a master plan made to serve another's usually financial interest. Think here of the decades old exploitation of Appalachian communities or the placing of toxic facilities in communities populated by poor people and people of color. These places cannot thrive because they have been engaged, because before they have been engaged, they have already been abandoned or measured as being of little worth. Place making begins by attending to who and what is there, and by learning the often painful histories of what has happened to bring us to where we now are. It continues by asking how this or that design will best further the goal of mutual flourishing. Put theologically, the work of design should ask, what could this place become if the love of God is its animating and orienting power? Placemaking always happens within economies that promote and constrain possibilities. A central problem with much of today's economic policy is that people do not need to live with the effects of what they do. Where does all the garbage go? In an anonymous global economy, they can hardly know if their choices are good ones. Where did the product come from and how was it produced? Today's consumer is at a loss to answer these questions. This is why it will be important for us to become advocates of local economies. Not that they will be perfect or solve all of our problems. They won't. But what they will do is increase the chance that people will see more clearly that every place Every creature and every product has a history in which multiple lines of co-development are implicated and need to be protected and honored. Better yet, they may inspire some of us to become active participants in the construction of a shared world and in our constructive work develop an appreciation for the multiple sources that must come together to achieve our aims. Placemaking is an improvisational activity. By this, I mean that it is a capacity for attunement and responsiveness that grows out of bodily postures of listening, waiting, attending, study, and curiosity. Think here of the farmer who does not try to grow everything, but only what the land and its creatures recommend, or the cook who by being patient and attentive to the qualities with ingredients is able to draw out flavors that honor flesh and fruit and then delight our palates. Think here of the craftsperson who is finely attuned to the qualities of stone and steel and wood and so is able to construct objects that are at once beautiful and contribute to the flourishing of the people who use them. Think also of the home builder who recognizes that children need room to dream and to play and so designs neighborhoods and houses that facilitate exploration and self-discovery. Think also of town planners who recognize the importance of civic engagement and so design communal spaces in which a diversity of people can easily gather and deliberate together. Placemaking is about being fully present and available to the call of others as they intersect with our living. It is about committing to be with others so that their need and potential can come into view, and then about coming alongside them in the canonic, self-dispossessive modes of Jesus Christ, who engages others so that they can more fully become themselves. As such, it is fundamentally about our participation in God's new creative work that is leading creaturely life into the Sabbath delight that God created as the climax of everything. Place making is what God has been doing from the beginning. It is what God continues to do today. And it is the work Christians are called to participate in. Thank you very much. I hope you find this uh, presentation something worthy of engagement and I hope to hear from you.